So it's a pleasure today to have Yanev from VMware Research uh, come and give us a talk about his work on resource efficient supervised anomaly detection uh, using tree based ensemble methods. Uh, Yanev, uh, his background is in network and software defined networks, um, but he's more recently looking into efficient resource management for machine learning frameworks. And with no further ado, have Yanev talk. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, so in this talk, I will present to you RED, which is a, a resource-efficient framework for supervised anomaly detection that supports tree-based ensemble methods. This, this work is a joint work with Shai Vargaftik, which is a postdoc in our group, and Isaac Aslassi, which is an affiliated professor in our group from the Technion. So I will start with a short background about what are tree-based ensemble methods just that we all be aligned about it, and then I would deep dive into the motivation of RED and the solution of RED and the evaluation, etc. So tree-based ensemble methods uh, are actually a prevalent tool for classification in general and specifically for anomaly detection. And there are many two kinds of methods for the tree-based uh, ensemble method. The first one and the well-known one is the bagging method, also known as random forest. In random forest, we actually train a lot of independent decision trees in a random way. And in order to get a projection out of a trained random forest, we actually average the histograms of the prediction that we get from each one of the decision tree. And we look, we look into the uh, aggregated histogram, we take the majority vote along with the likelihood or the confidence level of the classification of the random forest. So you can think about the confidence level as the probability the random forest thinks that is correct about this classification in some way, in a very simple way. Uh, random forest is known for its robustness in, uh, for uh, hyperparameters. It has low training complexity since that we train independently a lot of decision trees in a random way. Uh, it can handle imbalanced data sets in terms of the number of, uh, of instances uh, for each one of the labels, which, are which is very important for anomaly detection. And it can handle missing features, and also it can be trained relatively on smaller training data sets, for instance, as compared to neural networks. And it can be explained, which is uh, required in different domains right now. But it comes with a price, one of first known to be memory bound, which means that during classification, usually you will, you will incur a lot of cache misses, which will further uh, increase your classification latency. The other method is the boosting method, and there are a lot of algorithms and classifiers in that area, such as IGBoost, Adaboost, LightGBM, CutBoost, a lot of uh, different names and classifiers. The main idea behind this method is to train a given decision tree according to the classification result of the previous uh, uh, decision tree. So for instance, for Adaboost, we train a given decision tree according to the same training data set, but with the different weights for each one of the instances, which are calibrated according to the classification result of the previous decision tree. In gradient boosting, uh, we actually train the current decision tree according uh, by the residual error of the previous decision tree. Okay? So in other boost, the classification would be a weighted majority of all of the decision trees. Each one of the decision trees is assigned with a different weight. And for the gradient boosting, we actually need to sum the predictions of all of the decision trees in order to come with our final prediction. So boosting, because that boosting, in, in every iteration, in every decision tree, we try to improve the error of the, of the previous decision tree. Often, the boosting method provides better machine learning performance. And it also has much lower memory footprint, since that each decision tree is relatively uh, more shallow as compared to random forest, or even a stamp, which means that it's a decision tree with only one uh, level of depth. Uh, and similar to the bagging method, it can handle imbalanced data sets, uh, missing features, and small training data sets. And it can be explained, even though it, it is much harder than explaining a random forest, but still 
it can be explained if necessary. On the other end, the boosting methods are more sensitive uh, to overfitting since we try to focus on every iteration only on the error of the previous decision tree. The, lo the training time is obviously much longer since now we the, the training is section uh, uh, to do it in, 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 se in sequence uh, um, instead of in parallel for the random forest. And the classification is also much slower than random forest. So to summarize, both of these three based and semen methods suffers from at least one performance issue. The random forest mostly suffers from the large memory footprint, and both random forest and mostly the boosting method suffers from long training and high classification latency. Radian and Natural is a framework that reduces all of these performance issues. We reduce the memory footprint, we reduce the training time, we reduce the classification latency. And one would think that there is a trade-off. So if we will really improve the performance metric says that will come with a price in the anomaly detection accuracy. So actually, RAID does not have any anomaly detection performance degradation. As compared to using a monolithic optimized machine learning model, OK? And in some cases, as I will show you in the last slide of this talk, we're actually being able to improve the anomaly detection while improving the performance matrix as well. Uh, the framework, right, the framework is specifically designed for decision uh, uh, to be based on semen methods and for supervised binary anomaly detection use case right now. And we are going to expand it as I will uh, describe to you in the last slide of this talk. And the use cases that rate can be used right now are either real time or resource constrained uh, use cases, mostly for edge computing or IoT, for instance. OK, so let's start with several observations that RAID is based on. The first observation is that we can use a relatively small machine learning model in order to classify most of the classification queries correctly. Okay? So at the first step of RAID, we use a coarse grained model, which is a small model. It's, uh, and the, what I mean by small is something like 10% of the size of a monolithic optimized machine learning model. And in order to classify most of the classification queries such that a classification is defined to be valid only if the confidence level of this coarse grained model is higher than a, confi a, a confidence classification threshold, which is given. Now, just to give you some ranges, in RAID we use very high confidence level, which varies between 0 0.9 to 0 0.99. When usually in random first you take all of your classifications as valid and therefore the threshold is relatively much lower. It's something, it's supposed to be for a binary as a classification, just 0 0.5. Okay, so we have a query. If its confidence is higher than the threshold, it's considered as a valid classification in terms to the user. Okay. Let's see an example of a random forest with 20 trees and maximum depth of train. This is relatively very small random forest model. And this is for the KDD data set. It's a well-known uh, uh, cybersecurity data set that has been used by the machine, learning, uh, in the machine learning community. We can see here the confidence level. The blue line is actually the anomaly F1 score, which gives you a score about your anomaly detection performance. And the red line is the fraction of the valid classifications. So you can see that the anomaly F1 actually increases as the classification uh, confidence threshold increases. And that's OK, right? Because we actually require much higher confidence level from our valid classifications. But on the other end, the fraction of this valid uh, classification drops as the confidence level increases. The normal classifications, we have the same. So we can see that the, the normal F1 score is relatively high, which means that in this data set, it is very easy to detect the normal classifications. And again, as the confidence level increases, the fraction of the valid normal classification drops. Okay, Let's zoom out. And see that in RAID, 
for this configuration, we use a confidence uh, threshold of z that equals to 0 0.98. And for that configuration, we actually be able to serve 94% of the normal classifications and 98% of the anomaly uh, classifications. And you can see that we are doing it by a perfect anomaly uh, detection, which means that all of the anomalies that we classified as anomalies are actually an anomaly. And we identified all of the anomalies in the training data set. For in only the 88%, only from the valid, out of the valid classification. OK, so now the question is what we are doing with the rest of the uh, non-valid classification that hasn't been classified correctly by, with, with a sufficient confidence level by the Korsgren model. And that leads us to observation two in which we train fine-grained models to succeed specifically where the coarse-grained model is most likely to make a classification mistake, OK? And these fine-grained models actually serves the low-confidence classifications that couldn't have been classified by the coarse-grained model. And in, in order to do that, we leverage the classification confidence of the coarse-grained model in order to construct specific training data sets for each one of these fungal models such that each one of these fungal models becomes an expert for these hard data instances in the test data set that we are trying to classify. So I will start with the high level uh, architecture of RAID and then I will give some intuition about why RAID improves the performance metrics and then we will deep dive into the training procedures and the classification procedures of RAID. So RAID is composed of the Korsgren model and two Fungren models since right now I'm talking about the binary uh, supervised anomaly detection uh, use case and therefore we have two labels in our data sets. And therefore, we have two fungal models, as I will explain in the next slides. The Korsgren model is supposed to have low memory footprint since that we require that it will be small. So this is obvious. And also, its training time is relatively fast since we have to train a very uh, relatively small model. Okay? For the fungal models, they are usually m bigger than the Korsgren model, but they're usually smaller than the baseline models, which are the monolithic optimized machine learning models. And furthermore, they are being trained by much smaller training data sets. The training data sets that we are trained, that the fine-grained models are trained on are around 1% to 10% of the total training data set. And therefore, also, the memory footprint and the training time of this fine-grained model is supposed to be very low, so we'll show you in the evaluation of this stuff. In terms of the classification latency, most of the queries are being served by, by the Korsgren model, more, more than 90% of the classifications. And only the rest of the, class, the low confidence classifications are being served by other one of the Fungren models. And since that each one of these Fungren models is relatively small in size, it's also relatively fast. And actually, even for the worst case scenario of RAID in terms of classification latency, when you have to query the Korsgren model and the slowest Fungren model, the worst case classification latency of RAID often more, uh, is more lower than the average classification of an optimized monolithic machine learning. OK, so now I will uh, continue and describe to you the training procedure of RAID. So, and if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions, OK? So first, we train the Korsgren model according to the total, uh, to the entire uh, training data set. And once the Korsgren model is trained, we take the same training data set and we classify it by the Korsgren model. And we obtain the confidence level for each one of the instances in the training data set. Now we will consider the instances that we will use for the training of, this, of the fine-grained models will be only the instances which their confidence level is lower than the training confidence threshold. Okay? All of the rest of the high confidence classifications are actually dropped and not being considered for the training of the fine-grained models at all. In such way, in such that 
all of the low confidence normal classifications are using for the training data set of Pangen model one, and all of the low confidence anomaly classifications are used by the training data set of Pangen model two. Okay? Now, this version of RAID actually um, works well in terms of reducing all of the performance metrics, and also this version usually achieves the same anomaly detection uh, performance as the baseline models, okay? But there are some problems that we saw in this approach, and I will show you, I will describe what are the problems and how we solve them, and actually this solution actually allows us to beat the baseline models and to achieve much better anomaly detection performance. So what are the problems? So first, since that the Korsgen model is being trained on relatively much smaller number of, lower number of uh, anomaly labeled instances, its classification for, its low confidence classification for the anomalies is less accurate, okay? In terms of the confidence level that we get. In other words, the low confidence anomaly classifications usually have higher variance in their confidence level that we need to take into account. And the second reason is that we start with a small cardinality of anomaly labeled instances in the training data set, and we filter some of them according to the uh, confidence level and the threshold. And therefore, we left with even much smaller cardinality of anomaly labeled instances to train these two fungal models. And furthermore, we split them between the two which means that each one of these Fungen models, as the each one of the training data sets of these Fungen models consists of, of a very small number of anomaly labeled instances in the training data set, and therefore each one of these Fungen models is prone to overfeeding. And that's a problem. So in order to solve it, we would like each one of these training data sets to have as many as anomaly labeled instances as we can. So in order to solve this problem, we identify each anomaly labeled low confidence classification, and we use it for both of the training data sets, okay? So right now, the training data set of Fungen model one is composed of the true normal, false normal, and true normal in terms of the classification of the coarse grain model, and the Fungen model uh, in the same way. And Performance-wise, the training data sets of these Fungen models are uh, much smaller. They're usually less than 1% to 10% of the, the total uh, 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 training data set. And the anomaly labeled duplication that I just described you actually results in a very negligible increase in the training data set. But on the other end, machine learning-wise, we get much learning anomaly accuracy since that first we actually be able to improve the, the normal to anomaly ratio of, which means the number of, the, the number of instances which their label is anomaly and the number of instances which their label is normal. The ratio for, of the training data sets of these two fungal models are actually better than the ratio of the original training data set. And we use each one of these fungal models for a specific scenario, of, as I will describe you in the classification procedure. And therefore, each one of these fungal models is an expert in different scenario of the low confidence classification made by the coarse grain model. For the classification procedure, so we first query the coarse grain model, and if it's if the classification confidence. Uh, uh, is higher than the threshold, that's our uh, classification. And actually, we can serve more than 90% of the uh, queries by the Korsgren model. And the rest of the, the low confidence classifications are forwarded to Fungen model one if it is a normal low confidence classification by the Korsgren model. And this Fungen model is an expert in correct the mistakes that the Korsgren model has been done for the false normals, okay? Each false normal classification that has been made by the Korsgren model will be fixed by the Fungen model, 
That's the expertise of this fungal model. And the second fungal, the fungal model number two will handle of the anomaly low concentration classification. And will in is responsible to fix the false anomalies, low confidence classifications by uh, made by the Coursland model. Any questions so far? Um, okay, so RAID actually consists of three models, and now we need to configure all of the hyperparameters of RAID. So what I will describe to you is no different. There, there is no difference between what I will describe to you in, in this slide to the way that we need to configure any other classifier that is out there. Okay, all I'm giving you in this slide is some kind of a sensible hyperparameter tuning in terms of the ranges that you would need to use for each kind of hyperparameter for it. So let's start with the size of the coarse grain model. So we would like the coarse grain model to be small in size, and therefore, we first start with taking a, a monolithic machine learning model and get the, we just optimize it, okay? So we get the biggest machine learning model that achieves the maximum anomaly F1 uh, score. And now once we have this machine learning model, we know its size and we require that our uh, uh, Korsgan model would be smaller by some constant uh, factor. So let's say we would like the Korsgan model to be 10% of the size of an uh, optimized monolithic machine learning model. So that's the first range uh, for the parameters of the Korsgan model size. The Feingen model size are supposed to be uh, at least big as the Korsgan model and at most big uh, in size as the baseline model. So again, we have some range, uh, ranges for the size, uh, parameter sizes of the Fungen models. In terms of the thresholds, so there are two thresholds. One threshold that we are using during the, the training procedure, and one threshold that we are using during the classification. Okay, so let's start with the classification confidence threshold. So once we have our coarse grain model size fixed, we can classify all of the training data set and data data set by this Korsgren model and we can plot this curve as I showed you in the observation one uh, slide. And then we need to look in this, on this curve and to decide where should be our uh, a threshold. And we would like to choose a threshold such that we serve most of the classifications on one end and on the other end that we will achieve a better anomaly F1 score as compared to the uh, monolithic optimized machine learning model, which is the baseline model, okay? So we would like that the, valid the, the accuracy that we get by the valid classifications by the course grain model would be higher than the baseline model at first. And now we have to fine tune the training confidence threshold, which is supposed to be, as I will explain in the next slide, bigger or equal to the classification confidence threshold, okay? So the first case is that we can use actually the same thresholds, the same value for the same thresholds. We can train RAID with the same threshold as we used it during the classification, which means that we train and classify RAID and the same subset of low confidence classifications by the uh, coarse grain model. So this graph actually showed you, so this is the 0 0.5 uh, confidence level, and if you are going to the right, that means it, it considered as an anomaly. If you go to the left, it considered as a normal classification. And this range is actually represents the low confidence classifications, and this range represents the high confidence classifications, which are valid classifications and returned by the coarse grain model. Now let's take a look and see what happens when we are using a higher training confidence threshold as compared to the classification confidence threshold. And that means that we train RAID on a larger subset of low confidence classifications. And during classification, we actually query the fungal models with a smaller subset of low confidence classifications by the coarse model. And why is that? 
So first, first of all, from performance-wise, if I'm using a, a higher training confidence threshold, that means that I actually increased my training data sets. But what I'm getting out of it is actually better anomaly detection. That is, this is another way of way to improve the anomaly detection accuracy. And the reason is that we actually targeting by, by, by training on a larger subset, we're targeting the high variance of the confidence level of the low confidence classifications by the Corsican model on one hand. On the other hand, we actually train the fungal models with more examples than we are use them during the classification, which further improve the, the machine learning performance of, the, of this model. Uh, RAID is implemented in uh, Python 3 based on the scikit uh, library and can support any three based on SAML methods. And we uh, tested RAID for several classifiers. Among them are Random Forest, Ada Boost, Gradient Boosting, IGBoost, and IGBM. I will show you some evaluation results of RAID uh, for uh, three different data sets from three different domains and with different percentage of anomalies for each one of these uh, data sets. The first one is the KDD that I already mentioned. This is from the cybersecurity domain. And this, this data set contains relatively a lot of anomalies, 24% of anomalies. The second one is forest cover from the nature domain, which contains around 1% of anomalies. And the last one is credit card fraud from the finance domain, which contains around 0.1% uh, of anomalies, which is relatively low, uh, small. I'll present the result for one of first boost and other boost because they are the most known uh, and used uh, uh, three best and same methods out there. I'll present you the performance matrix, of, of course. And I will use the anomaly F1 as my anomaly uh, detection matrix, even though we get, we obtain similar results also for the total F1, area under the curve, and area under the precision recall. And the evaluation is based on five-fold cross-validation, and I'll keep one weight configuration against the optimized monolithic model, which is the baseline model, for both strong AWS EC2 instance and for a weak device, a Raspberry Pi 3 device. So this graph presents the, result, the performance results for the random forest over a strong AWS uh, EC2 instance. And this graph presents the relative improvement for the different uh, performance metrics uh, between the baseline to red. So this dotted line presents the baseline, uh, and the higher the point is, that means the better rate is in for, for this uh, scenario. And each one of this color represents the different uh, data sets that we evaluated. So we can see that the model size is uh, improved by up to three and a half X, the training time by three and a quarter X, and the classification latency by up to seven X. And you can also see the absolute numbers of RAID uh, configuration for each one of these uh, performance metrics. For the random forest, we actually obtain a similar and even much better results uh, for the training time. And for uh, the boosting, we can see that the training time and classification latency are actually more significantly improved as compared to the random forest. But on the other end, you can see that RAID actually uh, is bigger in terms of the memory footprint as compared to a monolithic, uh, uh, to the baseline model that is based on the boosting method. And the reason is that, that I remind you that the boosting methods are actually memory efficient, okay? And that means that RAID does not have any space or Slack to, to try to improve it. There is no room to improve the boosting methods in terms of the, their memory footprint. But that being said, since the trade is based on these boosting methods, and the boosting methods themselves are memory efficient, that means that trade is also memory efficient. And actually, in absolute numbers, memory results in few megabytes of memory footprint, which is relatively low and feasible. 
On the other end, you further improve the training time and classification latency, which are the big and most important issue right now for the boosting methods anyway. And again, we uh, observe the same results also for Raspberry Pi, and you can see that here the classification latency is more significantly improved over the Raspberry Pi. And in terms of anomaly detection, so this graph presents you the differential uh, improvement, which means the anomaly F1 of weight configuration minus the anomaly F1 obtained by the baseline model for the different methods and the different uh, data sets. So first you can see that KDD, we don't really improve the anomaly detection of KDD by RAID. And the reason is that, that RAID actually con uh, consists of a uh, relatively uh, high percentage of anomalies in the data set. But these two other uh, uh, data sets, the KDD, Cradford, and the Forest Cover contains around between 1% to 0.1% of anomalies. And for this uh, 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 data sets, we can see that one of first can improve the anomaly F1 by up to 2.5%, uh, which is a lot for anomaly detection. And for boost by up to uh, uh, half percent, and for other boosts by up to uh, uh, 1%. And the improvement for uh, the boost and other boost are more modest as compared to the run of first, but keep in mind that the starting point of the IGG boost and other boost uh, in terms of the baseline is much higher than the run of forest. Actually, the baseline models of the IGG boost and other boost achieve higher anomaly F1 score as compared to the baseline of the run of forest. And if you look at the absolute numbers that we achieved, so you can see that actually we achieved the highest anomaly F1 by the IGG boost, even though we got here the, the the lowest uh, improvement in terms of the differential improvement uh, between RAID and the baseline model. So I, I, in this talk, I present to you the basics of RAID, which is now targeting only the supervised anomaly detection, binary anomaly detection use case. There are some several other methods that we are considering right now that can further improve the anomaly detection. I remind you, we used the training data sets, the anomaly uh, labeled duplications, and the uh, different thresholds for training and classification in order to improve the anomaly detection. We have further other methods that we would like to uh, apply and, and in order to Im further improve the anomaly detection. We are working towards a, a supporting a multi-class classification. We can also use the same framework in order to support unsupervised anomaly detection, which is more reasonable for anomaly detection use cases. And we are working uh, on around the area of uh, how to explain and, and to get a formal solution definition of RAID right now. And we are working on mo different modifications of RAID in order to support different deployment options, whether they are resource constrained or real time. Uh, real-time applications either for IoT, edge computing, network switches, or programmable network interfaces. And we plan to uh, contribute RAID uh, as a classifier to the scikit community in the future. Now, if you would like to collaborate on either one of these uh, future directions that I'm working on or any other related tree-based uh, ensemble method in general or I'm also working on the intersection between neural networks and tree-based ensemble methods. Some of the, my research is going that way also. Please feel free to contact me, and I will be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you. Right. So the question was, how do I plan to uh, uh, use RAID for unsupervised anomaly detection? So I won't get into the details, but in overall, we will replace the random forest or the IGG boost with isolation forest. So there is a version of random forest for unsupervised anomaly detection, which called isolation forest. 
And with isolation force, you can detect anomalies which are un unlabeled. Thank you.